of all the animals that would have been in the stable, there most assuredly were sheep, plural, a bunch of them. Well, why? Uh, well, give me a couple of reasons why. Uh, and I've told you this before, but review is a wonderful thing because I haven't told you this in a few years, so you might have forgotten. Uh, Bethlehem uh, was known as a migdal eater. Uh, that might not mean anything to you, to a Jew in that day and time. It meant everything because a migdal eater uh, was a place where they, uh, the migdal eater uh, refers to the tower of the flock. That's what the word means in Hebrew. It was a, a tower that was built on a field that a shepherd would climb up into to watch his sh- a flock uh, to guard them from predators. A migdal eater. But he didn't just guard normal sheep. He guard, guarded sacrificial sheep. Uh, and uh, Bethlehem just happened to be one of the places in Israel, there were several, uh, where they raised sheep to be sacrificed in the temple. Another reason why Christ would have had sheep around him, because he ultimately was the essence of the Migdal Eder. He was the, the Lamb of God. In fact, that's what John the Baptist is going to say when he sees him when they're in their 30s. And as Christ approaches John the Baptist, John the Baptist looks at him and says in the book of John chapter 1, uh, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because he realized uh, the mission of Christ was to complete uh, the messianic call to be the ultimate Passover lamb. To fulfill everything that was foretold concerning the, 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 the Yom Kippur lamb, the day of atonement. He was all those rolled into one. So there must have been sheep there uh, because of the nature of Bethlehem being a sacrificial city. Um, but I, wanna, I don't want to look at that tonight because that's, we've already talked about Christ being the sacrifice when we talked about him being the goat for Yom Kippur. Uh, and there's more to talk about when you look at sheep because they're so instructive. So what I want to do is head in a different direction. We'll just proof text again. The mission of Christ was to be the lamb who laid his life down for us. That's a given. Uh, and in case you don't know that story, I need to repeat it to you through the words of Peter, who knew Christ very well. Uh, in his first epistle, he said, Uh, chapter 2 of his epistle, verse 24, says, He, Jesus, himself bore our sins in his body on a tree so that we might die to sins and live forevermore to righteousness. And so uh, that's why Christ died. He came to make us uh, his sons and daughters when we come to him in faith and we become righteous at that moment. Uh, But there's more to the story when you look at sheep. So I'm going to only look at two Two things tonight, two questions, which I know is freaking you out. It's a two-part sermon, should be three. Somewhere they teach you in grad school, it's got to be three parts. This is only two. It's the fun of leaving school. You can do what you want to do. That's what I enjoy. Um, So I only want to ask uh, two questions and then answer them uh, in simple questions, except my second question has nine supporting points. (laughs) Shocking, isn't it? I'm shocked. I shocked myself. But uh, anyway, we'll we'll get to uh, that. And it's going to take us a while. It's uh, 744 now, so sometime tomorrow morning. We want to look at two questions. Number one, why were sheep in the stable? Because we already know theologically why they were there. He is the ultimate lamb of God, right? That's a given. We understand that. But there's more to it than that. Uh, To understand why uh, there were sheep there with Christ the night he was born, we need to look at two prophets. One is Ezekiel and one is Micah. Uh, Ezekiel prophesied from uh, 593 BC to 571 BC. So um, if you uh, look at the fact that the nation fell in 586 BC, uh, the third invasion of the Babylonians, the first one coming around 609 uh, BC, uh, Ezekiel's prophesying the demise of the nation. Uh, And in chapter 34, which is riddled with the word uh, shepherd, we find this from God speaking against the false shepherds, the false politicians, and the false religious people of his day. God had had enough of that. And so he says in chapter 34, through the pen of Ezekiel, Thus says the Lord God, behold, uh, I am against the shepherds, and I shall demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So I'm going to remove them from political and religious office. Uh, So the shepherds, I almost said drain the swamp, but but we, this is old language, right? Uh, And that's what he's saying. I'm going to get rid of those politicians and religious leaders who've who've, uh, uh, done things to my nation that they should not have done. And so he says, so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be food for them. Because the politicians and the religious leaders took advantage of the people. And then God says something very interesting in verse 11. What does he say? For thus says the Lord God, behold, and that's emphatic in Hebrew. He wants to get your point. It's like a speed bump if you're reading it in Hebrew. He says, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I'll seek them out. Who did God say was going to come eventually and fix the situation? Another politician, 
what he say? It's in English. You can see it. I'm, one day I'm going to put it in Hebrew. And then you're going to really be looking like, huh? Okay, who did he say was coming? He, he's coming. He's coming. God's going to come and be the ultimate shepherd for his people because he's the only one who can actually bring peace. Now, this is interesting when you uh, theorize, you know, when he prophesied 593 B.C. to uh, 571 B.C. If you back up a couple hundred years, there was another prophet, prophet on another day. His name was Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, and he prophesied in chapter uh, 5 of the book of Micah. Uh, a very interesting concept about an, the shepherd who's coming. Uh, and he prophesied from 732 to 700 B.C. concerning the Babylonians that were coming. Now, the Babylonians didn't come till 586 B.C. And in 732 B.C., Micah, God's telling him, the Babylonians are coming. Every time I hear somebody tell me, this is a whole other sermon, tell me, there are just not enough facts to believe. Hello, are you paying attention to the evidence? Because how could a prophet know in 732 BC that a Babylonian uh, nation, which isn't even a superpower at the time, is going to invade their land and take them out through siege warfare? How could he know that with specificity? I don't even know what my Apple stock's doing in the next week. Do you? Or uh, whatever stock you might have. Or this is a stockless church. No. I'm just saying. <laughs> no. No. Uh, so back to my sermon. Uh, so Micah says this in chapter 5, verse 1. All right? He says, uh, now muster yourselves, speaking to the Israelites, the tribes of Judah, be, tribe of Judah before they fall to the Babylonians, 140 years before that fact. He says, now muster yourself in troops, daughter of troops. They, the Babylonians, uh, have laid siege against us. Hasn't happened yet, still 140 years down the road. It's, and so, it, he's so sure it's going to happen. He uses past tense language. He says, with a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. That's going to be King Zedekiah, their last king. So, but as for you, notice the contrast with the word, but it's a contrast. And if your parents tell you, yes, you can have the car, but something is coming that's the opposite of what you were thinking. So God says, but as for you, Bethlehem, uh, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From, uh, from you, one will go forth uh, for me to be the ruler in Israel. Um, how long has he been around, this king? What does it say? His goings have been from how long? Long ago. Well, like, how long's that? Uh, like 10 years, 15 years? How long's this king been around? What's he say? From the days of eternity. It's very interesting. Only the front row can read. <laughs> what would the back row say? He's, he's from days of eternity. Is that what I heard? They're from another church. I don't know. It, from days of eternity. He just said he's timeless. So Ezekiel says when the... When the uh, um, when the shepherd comes, that's coming, God said, I'm coming, uh, he verifies that. Micah says, oh, yeah, he's coming. Yeah, and let me verify in two ways. Emphatically, he's coming. He's from eternity, timelessness. I mean, he's outside of time and space. There's only one being outside of time and space, God, by definition of who he is. He says he's coming. What? What kind of form is he going to be taking? Well, it says in verse 3, therefore he will give them up until the time when she who, sit, she who is in labor has born a child. Oh, that's interesting. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Judah. So the tribe is split. If you study Jewish history, it's split in 930 BC over taxation with Rehoboam taking the reins of the, the kingdom from his father Solomon. Uh, and he said, if you think my dad taxed you a lot, wait till you see me in action. Uh, and he taxed them into oblivion and they separated. Ten tribes went to the north. Uh, two tribes went to the south. So this is about the reunion of that nation, this prophecy. He says, and he will arise uh, and the shepherd, shepherd of his flock uh, in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. So he's telling you the Messiah is coming. Messiah is coming. Messiah, the anointed one. And what role is he going to play? Starts with the letter S. Shepherd. He's going to be a shepherd of his people, Israel. He's going to bring the kingdom to them as promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalm 89, Isaiah chapter 2. Kingdom's coming, Messiah's coming, and his role will be a shepherd. And Ezekiel says later, oh yeah, God's going to show up. It's amazing. Why did there have to be sheep in the stable with Christ? Who was in the hay? The shepherd, not a shepherd. It wasn't indefinite. It was most definite. The shepherd, as prophesied for hundreds and hundreds of years, he had arrived. So if sheep could talk, 
What would they have been saying to each other? Now, the last service was most interesting. I asked this question. I don't know where these people came from. The, last, the first service was super quiet. It didn't even answer that question. It's a rhetorical question demanding some kind of response. The second time I asked it in the second service, they all bawled like sheep. <laughs> you were thinking about that, right? Uh-huh. I can tell you. Yeah. You like to joke around like I do. So um, if sheep could be talking, what would they be saying with the shepherd being born? Bah, thank you. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. They would be high-fiving each other with their little hooves and everything. He's here. My, man, my whole family line for thousands of years have been waiting for him. He's right over there. Ba ba ba. You know, he's right there. Right there. Amazing. Because they'd be so excited that he had finally arrived as prophesied. And he was the eternal one. This was God. Now, how long is he? Is, well, this description of his eternality is most interesting. Uh, Dr. Charles Feinberg, uh, he's now deceased and with the Lord. He was a Jewish man who came to faith. A very smart man, uh, taught Hebrew at Talbot Seminary back in the day. Um, his books are hard to find now. If you find them, I would suggest you read them. Excellent scholar, Old Testament scholar. Uh, he looked at the Messiah's uh, credentials and became a believer based upon his study of the Torah and the, the prophets, the Nebaim. And he writes concerning that phraseology. His goings have been from long ago. He writes this. This rule from Micah 5, 2, comes from, uh, he comes forth from Bethlehem in time, but he, the coming one, is not circumscribed by time. His going forth have been from old, from everlasting. He says, these goings forth were in creation, translated, he was there. Uh, in the appearance of the patriarchs, he was there. And throughout the Old Testament history of redemption, he was there. This is some kind of shepherd because it's God. He goes on to say the phrases of this text, and he's absolutely right are the strongest, most possible statement of infinite duration in the Hebrew language. You can't get more specific. Who was coming? God, as prophesied. Prophesied. Now, what I find interesting is he's going to tell you what city he's going to be born in, and he adds another name to it. It's called Bethlehem, and then he adds that other terminology to it. Bethlehem Ephrathah. What in the world is that? Well, there were two Bethlehems in Israel. Did you know this? It's a trivia question. Uh, there were two Bethlehems. There was one in the north by the Sea of Galilee in the tribe of Zebulun. And there was another one down in the south where the kingdom of uh, David had been born into. Uh, and that's where Jesus is born. He's born in that one. God is so specific in the prophecy, 700 years before it even happened, he even isolates which Bethlehem it was. And when Herod runs into the Magi who've come out into town with all their entourage and, and, uh, and uh, gifts and everything for the, the new king, he wants to know, uh, where are you going and who are you going to see? And he turns to his uh, religious leaders and he asks them in the book of Matthew chapter 2, you know, why are they going to Bethlehem? I mean, there's nothing down there. I mean, it's a little backwater village. I mean, there's nothing over there. And the religious leaders of his day tell him that it is, they quote Micah chapter 5 verse 2 and they say, well, from that city, God's coming as a shepherd. This is very interesting. You've got to stop and kind of pause on that one for a minute. The religious leaders knew the truth of the prophecy, but didn't know the God of the prophecy. I mean, think about it. Are you a person who knows theology? Oh, yeah, 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 I know that. But do you know the God of the theology? That's the difference. Uh, in Micah chapter 5, verse 3, uh, God informs Israel that they would be given up to their enemies, the Babylonians, uh, that they would be degraded as a people, but there was going to be a birth a birth. What birth? Well, it's a twofold birth. Eventually, the nation would be born to where the tribes of Ju tribe of Judah would be reunited with the, the northern tribes, and they'd become a mighty nation under the reign of another one that's born to another woman, the Messiah, the shepherd. That day is still yet in the future, but he's called a shepherd. And if you were God and you had to pick a title uh, to come to earth by, could you imagine, I mean, what people today would pick if they wanted to like show up? I highly doubt it'd be a shepherd. No, God says, when I come uh, to take care of sin and sinners, I'm taking a humble form of a shepherd because I care about sheep. Why were there sheep in the stable? Because who was in the hay? The shepherd of all shepherds had arrived. Which leads to my second question. Remember, I only had two. You remember, I only, I only had two. What does a shepherd do for his sheep? I mean, really, what does he do for them? 
And it was a, you know, it's a thought I pondered. And this Christmas, I've been thinking about, you know, what has my shepherd in my lifetime done for me uh, other than redeem me and all the things that he's done? What does a shepherd do for his sheep? Uh, there's no better place to find the answer to that question than Psalm 23. How many know Psalm 23? You, you know, you could quote the first, maybe first verse or two, or maybe the whole thing. Uh, it's a great psalm. And the whole psalm I find most interesting is written from the perspective of a sheep, a little lamb. Who's the one that wrote this? Well, it says it's a psalm of David, David. Uh, David wrote this. Who would better know about a sheep and a shepherd than David? That's what he did as a living before he was the king. Notice what it says, in case you don't know the psalm. It says it's a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. What's the result of that? I shall not want. If he's my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness, not for my name's sake, but for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the deaf, I personally, he says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You've anointed my head with oil, resulting in the fact that my cup just is overflowing in my life. And really, he says, as I look back at my life, two things are true. Surely goodness and mercy, they have been following me all the days of my life. And when I die, what happens? I as your sheep, I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because you're the forever kind of God. This is amazing. We want to look at, as we look at the coming of the shepherd, the answer to the first question, why the sheep have to be there? Well, because the shepherd was born. Now we want to look at it from the perspective of, of a sheep. What's he do for us, that great shepherd? How many things did I tell you that he did for you? Nine. You're most attentive. Nine things. And you can, you can divide these up different ways and come up with 10. I'll, if you do, I'll forgive you. You could. Uh, we're going for nine. All right? It's the quietest church I've ever had in my entire life. Is it for you, Darren? Yeah. Is it just Christmas? You're just tired from shopping and everything? Yeah. Liz and I showed up at the Fair Oaks Mall area today at about 10 o'clock. There was no one there. It was a miracle. Back to my sermon. Okay. <laughs> so what do we find here? We find, uh, the ver he begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd to set up the nine things. So the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, the Lord. It's emphatic in Hebrew. It's placed at the front of the sentence to get your attention. It's the Lord. And it's capital L-O-R-D, not capital L, small O-R-D, which that would be Adonai, but this is not Adonai. This is Yahweh. And if that makes any sense to you, uh, Yahweh is the great name of God related to the verb to be. Because when, when Moses said, uh, if you're going to use me as, you know, as an 80-year-old man to deliver your people, I've at least got to have a name. What's God's name? Well, you've read, you've seen the movie, Cecil B. DeMille and, and Exodus 3, 14, 15. God says out of the burning bush, tell them I am sent you. Your name's a verb? Yeah. <laughs> I have no beginning. I have no end. I am the I am. See, this is the word that he uses here. It's most interesting. The Lord, the great I am of all history, the, the Lord of the burning bush, uh, I'm your shepherd. You know, if the Lord is your shepherd, it truly is, you are truly able to say, I shall not want. Because if you think about the Lord, uh, he's emphatically saying, uh, the great I am of the burning bush is, is with me. The, the God who created time and space is with me. And there was no time before he created. It was, he created time out of nothing. Uh, he's the one who is the, uh, the outside of causation, cause effect chain. We can't break out of cause effect. I mean, it goes back, we think, to infinity, but there has to be the first cause. But then this bothered me as a nine-year-old child. I remember asking my parents, well, who created God? <laughs> I mean, he's the first cause. No one. He's beyond causation. He's non-caused. He's outside of that. He says, the Lord, the God of all time, outside of time and space, is my shepherd. We could basically stop the sermon right there and say, that's enough for me. Because if he is your Lord, he's your shepherd, why are you worried? Why are you worried? He's, he's there. And he says, based on that, I shall not want. Now, the Hebrew word means I shall not lack. I shall not lack. Which is really what I think David is saying, because I'm sure he had a lot of things in his life that weren't primo. If you go back and read First and Second Samuel, you realize he had lots of dysfunction, lots of issues, lots of ups and downs, won battles, lost battles, did sinful things. But when he looks back over his life and he says, as I as a godly man look back over my life, I can say one thing. 
that God has taken care of me every step of the way. I mean, when Liz and I got married, we had absolutely no money. Were you broke when you got married? <laughs> yeah. And you now look back and think, how did we do that? What were we thinking? Are, are you, is this, you, can you relate? Yeah, how many were broke? And you made it. Amen. And you're still broke. No, I mean, now you're, it's better for you. <laughs> You know, an uncle came to me and he gave me a check and he said, here, Marty, this will help launch you and Liz. And it was 1980. It was a check for $500. I'm like, I'll never have to work. (laughs) You know, but we've, we look back now after 36 years of marriage and can say as a Christian couple, whether we had had very little or we had much all along the way, whatever the needs were that we had, we've never really been in a state of want. Because God has always said, I'll give you exactly what you need. And I remember, I mean, not that I, I didn't share this with the other two services, so it pays to come to the third service. When Liz and I were in seminary and we were making $9,000 a year and tuition was 4000 okay? And we lived on the difference. Uh, and she got a job in a dental office with a doctor, Dr. Theme. It wasn't a Christian man. Uh, he had been an engineer with, a, I think, a Chevron, then he became a dentist, very successful, uh, not a Christian couple, and he came to us, uh, and he helped us all along the way with whatever happened to us. And then when I started a PhD, he said, you know what, I'm going to buy you guys a house. And he did. You know, I mean, just a great guy. My car would break, he would fix it. You know, and, and now that I look back at it years later, I would say, you know, he, he was being used by the shepherd, was he not? And God was saying, I will take care of you, my child. I'm, I'm your Lord. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry. So if you're worried tonight, uh, you should be more worried that we still have nine points to go through. <laughs> Number one, what does God do? Jesus, the good shepherd. That's who he is, by the way. Did you know this? He claims that in John chapter 10. He's the good shepherd. He, indeed, he is. He's, he came. What's he do? He, he makes you lie down in green pastures. And when I read that this week, I thought, this is really interesting. It says, makes you lie down. Now, I didn't really understand that when I lived in California, and it was much more laid back my whole life out there, until I moved here. (laughs) This, when I applied for this job, I was asked lots of questions. One of them was, can you survive in a type A personality environment? Like, you you don't even know who you're talking to. (laughs) Yes, I can. Uh, but I understand it as a type A person that God has to do this to me. What, what does he do to you? He makes you lie down. Do you have a hard time stopping? Not saying no, not getting involved in one more thing. See, that's when God, your shepherd comes to you and goes, uh-uh, don't commit to that. Don't take that. Relax, back up. You need some quiet time. You need to get away. You're getting too overloaded, etc. He comes in and says, I need to make you lie down. He has to make you do it. It's, the funny thing about sheep is they... Have you seen one lie down? They're usually what? Standing. Why are they standing? Well, I did a little research this week. Uh, They stand for a couple of reasons. I love my job. Uh, So they stand for a couple of reasons. Number one, they they stand because they're not getting along with other sheep. So they got to keep an eye on Helen over there or whoever. (laughs) Sound familiar? Um, they, they don't like to lie down because they like to look for the next food grouping. So that, in that sense, they're kind of like a high school student looking for the next five guys. But they're, they're kind of like that. Uh, and so they, don't, they won't sit down. So the shepherd has to come along and go, you're going down. And when he, when he puts them down, where does he put them down? Green pastures where there's plenty of food. And he says, you need to eat there. You have to ask yourself if you're a sheep of God. And there's really two things you could be tonight. A goat or sheep. If you're a goat, you're your own shepherd. You don't know the shepherd. But if you're a sheep, I used to be a goat. I traded and became his sheep. When you become a, a, a lamb in God's, uh, God's kingdom, uh, he makes you lie down in green pastures and he feeds you. Boy, does he. There's not a day I have not opened this book and fed away. And there's not a time when I've disciplined myself, even though I do it for a living, that I get off on my own and I open and I read it. And I thank God that I took time out to listen to him because it's food for the soul. It's always a green pasture. There's there's no end to the food. And sometimes it's a book I'm reading about that book. 
And I'll make so many notes and so many coffee stains all over those books by Swindoll, whoever, because God fed me through that like a shepherd. Number two, Jesus, the good shepherd, leads you beside quiet waters. Quiet waters as opposed to noisy waters. Because sheep, they could have, you ever had cotton mouth? I'm from the deserts of Southern California. I get cotton mouth. If they had cotton mouth, they wouldn't even dare drink out of a moving river. It scares them to death. So they stand there and stare at the water going by. Are you thirsty? I am. You going to stick your mouth in? Not me. No way. I ain't doing it. So what's the shepherd do? The shepherd comes along and he takes a bunch of rocks and begins to build around in the water to shoot the water off to the side to make it drain over and form a little pool. And when he forms a pool, then he goes and gets a sheep and says, you need to come over here and get a drink out of this nice, cool, clear, quiet water. Isn't that what you need in the business of your life as a shepherd who will tell you, you need to slow down and you need to get some water in your life? Well, water like what? In the book of John, chapter 7, Jesus said, this, in John, chapter 7, he says, um, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Uh, he who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, the first time you come drink from the water of Christ, it's life to eternal. That's when you trade goat, goat them for being a sheep. And then that water of the Spirit begins to flow through your life because verse 39 says that the water in John 7 is the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that water that he satisfies you with is that, is that Spirit in you bringing forth his fruits. Sometimes it's a, it's a song. Sometimes it's a song. Uh, there's an old song that I have on my different devices with iTunes I like to listen to. Um, I'm very eclectic in the kind of music I like, but I love this old hymn. Because it's kind of like my life. It's called abide with me. Abide with me. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me. Abide. When others fail, boy, that happens a lot in life. And comforts flee, help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me. Swift to its close, ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories, they're going to pass away. Change and decay in all around me, I see. O oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. That's the prayer of a sheep. God, abide with me. And what's the shepherd say? I never left. I never left. Three, the good shepherd restores your soul. Why? Because you as a sheep will wonder. That's what sheep do. If you leave them to their self, they'll be all over the hillside. And you'll commit sin. And you have to come back to the shepherd. And he says to you, I'll wash you. I'll clean you. I'll restore you. Four, the good shepherd guides you in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. This is what he does. He teaches you how to live a moral life. Uh, here's a picture I took of a bunch of sheep uh, in Israel uh, last time I was there about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was in the Valley of Elah. I was in the riverbed where David would have taken on Goliath, where he would have picked up the stones to fight Goliath. And on that hill uh, that you see there was where the Philistines would have been on the top of that. And in between them is a little valley with a little river. Uh, and the Philistines would send Goliath down to the bottom of that riverbed to scream at the Jewish soldiers on the other side. And that's where the battle took place. But when I was there uh, in April, about a year and a half, two years ago, it was I'd never seen sheep there before. They were everywhere. They were everywhere, and they, were, they had two dogs and one shepherd, and the dogs were constantly working the perimeter, and the shepherd was guiding them. And if you look at the picture, uh, vertically, there's a nice path. See, going up straight? If I was the shepherd, I'd be past of least resistance. He's taken them across that through thick brush. There was a lot of thistle and weeds and stickers and things. He's taking them through that, that path. And I'm watching him taking pictures thinking, that's like Christ with my life. I think, oh, no, Lord, that, that path's better, morally speaking. And what does God say? No, 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 no. Don't go down that path. This one's better. Five, Jesus, the good shepherd, walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Indeed, does he not? How many soldiers in a Huey helicopter in Vietnam getting ready to land in some kind of hot LZ did not pray that prayer on their descent? The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, how many soldiers, Marines in landing craft approaching Iwo Jima, realizing that when the gate came down, it could be over for them as one of my dad's friends ran to the beach. How many people prayed that? Lord, you are my shepherd. You are with me. And though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Who has not been with a family member on a ventilator 
and you know it's close. And you've not stopped as a family and, and held hands. I've been there. And you pray that prayer. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me and death is but a shadow. There's no fear of a shadow. I went to go visit an old lady one night. I didn't know her. She was in her 80s. She was a scientist. She founded the pharmacy school at University of Pacific. She and her husband. Uh, her daughter attended my church, her granddaughter. And uh, they said she was going to die that night. So her granddaughter said, could you go see my grandmother and pray with her? So I did. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was walking down the hallway. Lights were dimmed. I couldn't hear anybody. No one was there. But I could hear someone singing at the top of her voice down the hallway. This is what she was singing. I'm looking now just across the river to where my face shall end in sight. There's just a few more days to labor, then I will take my heavenly flight. Beulah land, I'm longing for you. And someday on thee I will stand. There my home shall be in eternal Beulah land. Oh, sweet Beulah land. When I walked into the room, there was an 80-something-year-old woman propped up in bed, dying and singing. I, as a young man, went to encourage her. <laughs> I got encouraged by her. And I said, why are you singing? And she says, young man, she said, I know where I'm going. And I'm about to cross the river into the presence of God. And I can't wait. And it blew my mind, the assurance of her faith. Why? Because she knew the Savior. It says also that Jesus, your good shepherd, will prepare a table before you in the presence of his enemies, or your enemies. Life's full of enemies. And a shepherd back in that day would find a table pasture land, would go around and find all the, the viper holes and pour oil around the viper holes. So when the viper came out, it had no traction. Therefore, they couldn't bite his sheep. And how many times in your life have you not thanked God for going around to the viper holes in your life and pouring oil around and protecting you in ways you don't even know about? Seventh, it says the good shepherd blesses you in a big way throughout your life to where your cup flows over. And indeed, hopefully at this Christmas, you can look back at your life and say, whether I had little or I had much, God always made my cup overflow in bountiful ways. Eighth, the Jesus, the good shepherd, well, he sends two things after you throughout your life. It's called goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Uh, when people speak evil of you, I've been there, God sends those two things. He sends goodness and mercy. When life throws you a curveball, the shepherd comes along and says, let me give you grace. Let me give you mercy. You know, when you think your marriage is tough and maybe it's all over, God comes along as your shepherd and says, no, let me, let me give you goodness and mercy. When you're having a hard time raising a child, the shepherd comes along and says, no, let me, let me give you grace and mercy into your, into your life. That's what he does. And the last thing he does for his sheep is the day you draw your last breath is the day you walk into his presence. What could be better? Here's what Jesus said, and I leave you with his words. Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me in my Father's house or many mansions. And if I go and I prayer, prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am as a sheep, uh, you might be also. And you know the way of where I'm going. And Thomas said, uh, he's the doubter. He's the man. I need some facts. Uh, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And, and, and how do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, Thomas... I am the way, I am the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me, the shepherd. Uh, do you know the shepherd? Is he your shepherd? He was born in that little stable to be the shepherd, and boy, does he take care of sheep. May you give him thanks and praise this Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, and let's pray. Father God, we pause to pray and give you thanks uh, for the work of a shepherd in our lives, and if anyone doesn't know the shepherd tonight, might this be the night they move into your kingdom and become part of your family, your fold. Bless us as we continue to worship you. Amen.